Okay, I believe we've admitted everyone to the uh, to the to the uh, meeting. I'm Dave Munger. It's nice to have you all here. Uh, I'm the uh, C the executive director emeritus for the Council of Neighbors and Organizations, which basically means I'm retired. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's I'm pleased to be joined today by the clerk and recorder for El Paso County, Chuck Brewerman, and the city clerk for Colorado Springs, Sarah Johnson. I um, want to just give you a little bit of information before we start, and that is to remind you that um, we are recording this session so that um, not only is it preserved forever, but that people can go back and take a look at it uh, if they haven't been able to join us. And we uh, are very grateful to our speakers for being here. Uh, for those of you who are participating, um, I've kept your mics off for now, and it'd be great if you keep your mics off too, just to avoid feedback problems. But um, when you have a question, I'll be glad to recognize you for that. If you have a question, please uh, either text me at my cell phone, 719-337-5838, or text me using the uh, text mechanism, the chat mechanism, sorry, the chat mechanism on, on Zoom. Um, and I will get to you as soon as we can um, on those sorts of things. And then uh, many of you know what, what Kono is, but for those of you who don't, I'll, I'll tell you that the Council of Neighbors and Organizations is a, is a nonprofit organization that provide services to neighborhoods and, and groups of people who would like to be neighborhoods, like to be recognized as neighborhoods. We help them with their organizational issues, with uh, representing themselves before city and county government, and, um, and also before developers and other folks that they need to interact with. We help with elections, we help with disputes, that sort of thing. In many cities and counties our size, what Kono does is done by a uh, a county or a city government. But we do things differently as uh, both the clerks can can testify, we do things differently in this city and this county and it seems to be working well. Uh, we depend for our support on, um, uh, on government to some extent, but we also get a lot of support from individuals and from uh, grant making organizations and those sorts of folks. Um, Richard Strasbaugh, our CEO of Kono, is on the screen. Richard, would you, there we go. And um, I think with that, we will begin. Um, Chuck Brorman is the, as I said, the uh, clerk and recorder for the County of El Paso. Chuck, why don't you shake your, there you go. You're shaking your head, that's great. And, <laughs> Make and, sure I'm not swallowing asleep, huh? <laughs> yes, and no, that bad, I was just, uh, introducing you first since Sarah is going first and uh, so I'm pleased to pleased to turn this over to Sarah Johnson uh, who is the clerk for the city of Colorado Springs. Sarah it's nice to have you here. Thank you thanks for the invitation. So it's good to well it's good to have you on board and when you're ready for your slides uh, there we go hey. Richard's got them up. Great. Uh, well, thank you. It's, it's great to be here and I appreciate the invitation. And just to give you a little background, I'm from Kentucky. You'll hear the accent occasionally slips out on me. I've been in Colorado for about eight years and been here in the office for eight years. It's been a fast eight years uh, right now. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about the Colorado Springs City Clerk's Office. So next slide, please. So what the city clerk does is we are the official record keeper and custodian of the seal of the city. That's really exciting to be the keeper of the seal. Um, and we also work with city council. We do their agendas, minutes, ordinances, make sure everything that they pass gets uh, fully executed. I conduct the municipal elections for the city of Colorado Springs, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then we also do business licensing um, for those that live in the city of Colorado Springs. So I like to affectionately say that I 
do, do elections, work with city council, and I do a little bit of licensing sin is what I call it. And you'll see that in just a second when we go over the types of licenses that I have. So next slide, please. So we basically have contacts with over 38,000 individuals through our office every single year. That's uh, via email or if that is in coming into our office. We're quite a busy office located on the first floor of the city administration building here at corner of Nevada and Colorado. So you're welcome to stop by if you're downtown. But that's just an idea of kind of what we're dealing with on our side and it does not include any election work when we when we um, have a municipal election because that whole chart is election when it comes to that point. So uh, next slide, please. So just to give you an idea of what the city of Colorado Springs does for licensing, we license all the liquor establishments. We have about 950 licensed liquor establishments that includes bars, restaurants, taverns, those kind of places. And we also do medical marijuana. That is all that's a that is um, allowed in the city of Colorado Springs or medical marijuana facilities. And we have about 121 dispensaries um, throughout the city of Colorado Springs. And then we also do some other uh, occupation specific licensing like mobile food vendors and pawnbrokers, as you can see on this list and people that are digging in our city streets and doing all that road work, all those cone zones that we all have fun dodging when we're driving in the city. And also right now, really big for us is tree service. A lot of you are doing some landscaping and we license those and make sure that they truly are educated in how best to um, trim a tree so as not to kill the tree. And we work with the Parks Department on that. So that's an example. And we do have a one pedal cab agency that we recently licensed. So if you're in the downtown area and you want to ride, um, there is a pedal cab company that you'll see out on the streets of downtown. So next slide, please. So one of the big things that we're, we'll talk about today are elections. And so the city clerk by our city charter and our city charter is pretty much like the constitution on a municipal level um, has the city clerk conducting those elections. We do have a general municipal election every um, odd year first Tuesday in April, as a matter of fact, and then city council uh, can place questions on that ballot. They can also place questions on the, the upcoming November election ballot. So just to let you know, Chuck, I suspect we'll have several <laughs> on that ballot. Looking forward to it. Heads up on that one. Um, uh -huh. and all of our city elections are conducted by all mail ballot and the city was actually uh, doing all mail ballots years before um, the state went all mail ballots. And so it's a great way to vote and we encourage everyone to vote in, in the upcoming June election, which Chuck will talk about in November and then hours in April of 2021. Next slide, please. So one of the most important things that, that we're doing this year uh, right now, we just started the process, is the city charter requires the city clerk to review the six council districts. So our city council is comprised of nine members, three at large members who serve citywide, and then six individual district members. And those six district members will be what's on the ballot for um, next year, uh, April 6th actually is the election date. So I'm required to review those districts and to make them, you know, as equal in population as possible, but also trying to keep communities of interest together and to make them contiguous and kind of geographically make sense um, in the district. And so a city council member represents around 74,000 people. And now with the influx of population, uh, they'll be representing closer to 80,000 individuals. So the process has started, um, starting uh, at the end of last month, the redistricting um, advisory uh, public process committee where citizen volunteers, um, there are six of them and they have been appointed by council. And so I'll be working with them uh, to help kind of get out there and get the community's thoughts on processes and potential district boundaries and how they look. And just to let anybody know, the east and north uh, east districts of our city, as you can imagine, are too big. So we do need to reduce that population and shift around the other districts. It's like a giant puzzle uh, to make those as equal and con 
contiguous as, as we can and also keep community of his interest together again. So just to let you know, that's what we'll be doing this year. So stay tuned for a lot more information on our website and through media on how you can look at those and comment on those and give us some ideas on that. Next slide, please. So that is a map, a tiny map, I agree, uh, of our six council districts. That's how we've divided the city up. And as I said, District 2 and District 6 are the ones that are too big. So again, they will lose population and the other four districts will need to adjust to kind of capture that population. And it's also a great opportunity um, to kind of unite more communities and interests like HOAs, for example, that Kono deals with. We do take a look at those and try to keep those in one district as much as we can. And we also work very, very closely with um, Chuck Broerman, the county clerk here, uh, because the base of our, our districting is based off of election precincts. And so we do work super close together on everything. Um, next slide, please. So just to let you know, we I spoke a little bit about my work with city council. I think it's important that everybody know that city council meetings are held on the second and fourth Tuesday of the month in council chambers. Those are actually being held right now because of our COVID-19 uh, issues and social distancing that we're doing those via Teams. And so there's no public really allowed other than presenters inside the chambers, but you can participate from the comfort of your own home. And we encourage everyone to do that. And there are opportunities to have to comment on items or just comment on things not on the agenda. So those and the work sessions are the day before. So for example, Monday, the, yesterday and Monday, we had our city council meetings, the first set for the month of June. And there, that is the website that you can go to find the calendar, or you can always just reach out to our office or look on the city's website. So I encourage everyone to get involved in government, whether it's the county or the city, and particularly know who your council member is, because guess what? If you live in the city of Colorado Springs, you're going to get a ballot next April. Um, end of March, I should say, next April, and you're going to be asked to vote on those members. So go ahead and start educating yourself now. If you're interested in running for those districts, feel free to call me. We'll um, start that process in the 1st of January. So thank you. That is a quick overview. I talk fast. Um, there you go. So check. <laughs> Sorry, I had to unmute myself. It's Dave again. I'm going to uh, just interject um, that Sarah mentioned that uh, keeping, trying to keep neighborhoods together in the districting process and redistricting process. And that was a very big thing when we were, when the city council directed that those sorts of things be considered uh, as part of the districting process. And um, it makes, uh, it, it fits into uh, national and state guidelines about how to keep people of similar interests together. Um, we think it's very appropriate, but we're very grateful to both the city and Sarah for making that happen. And now, Chuck, I've taken some of your time. I apologize. Oh, that's all right. All uh, right. It, we'll send it on to you. And all right. there's your there's your your slide. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dave and Richard, for having me. Um, you know, I'm a transplant also from the Midwest like Sarah. I'm from the great state of Ohio. Go Buckeyes for those that are Buckeye fans. But I moved here 32 years ago, and we had a, a new home that was built on the east side uh, along Powers Corridor. And I became very acquainted with the Council of Neighborhood Organizations. We had a number of issues that we had that was before us as as citizens out along the Powers Corridor, and Jeannie Matthews uh, was very nice to take take me and our, our neighbors under her wing and shepherd us. We had a number of things from special improvement districts that weren't being managed uh, well or correctly to a metropolitan district that built Powers Corridor that was, when it was built, uh, the developers who went under, it was, it was gonna largely be on the shoulders of about 118 um, residents out there on a uh, multi-million dollar thoroughfare um, but with Jeannie's help and a number of city council members and county commissioners we came together and were able to do some things that was able to um, 
not sterilized development in those neighborhoods, and now that's an important piece of infrastructure uh, for the city well, and the state. That's actually a state highway now. Um, so that, that's uh, my, my story career with uh, the Council of Neighborhood Organizations. So they have a dear, dear spot in, in my heart. So in the Clark and Recorder's office, we do some things that are very similar to Sarah Johnson's office with the city, but some things that are uh, uniquely different. We're, we have four statutorial authorities under the state constitution and statutes. We have motor vehicle, we have elections, we have recording and clerk to the board functions. Um, we are often confused with the, the clerk of courts. So I get probably several times a day where I will have citizens that will email me about, hey, their court date or get divorce records. Uh, while we do marriage licenses and recording, we uh, we don't we don't administer the courts, so uh, uh, sometimes that's a confusion of folks. But but we're always uh, always there to help get people pointed to the right um, right area. So um, first off, our motor vehicle department, um, one of the areas that people know us very very well. You know, we help citizens to register their vehicle, uh, renew their their um, their tags. Uh, renew driver's license, issue plates, and handicap placards. Our office has five motor vehicle offices, including one at Fort Carson, and we're very unique in that because um, our citizens wanted that, our military wanted that. We really work hard to improve the quality of life for our military members that are, are stationed here. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a responsibility that we, we do with a lot of gusto. We are the only county in the state that has motor vehicle services on a military installation. The Pentagon, which is a city of itself, does have a motor vehicle office there, but outside of the Pentagon, um, we are the only place that has uh, constituent services on, on a military installation, and um, we're very proud of that and, and, and love that we're able to do that. Um, we are also the only county that offers Saturday office hours for people to record a document, get a marriage license, or do motor vehicle services. We get approximately 550,000 citizens a year that come through our offices to um, do a motor vehicle transaction. So um, that's something that we do differently than, than, than the city. Um, we also have been working very hard over the last number of years to make um, people's um, transactions with us um, even easier. We have online renewals of license plate tags. You can do it by mail, you can do it by phone, and we rolled out. Now we have eight um, kiosks, um, four that are in our motor vehicle offices and four that are in local King Supers, and we're adding more and more all the time that allows someone, um, while they're shopping, to be able to renew their, their tags, not have to come in in line. We love our citizens uh, to come in, and we love it when they come in visit us in motor vehicle, but um, you know, if you can do it while you're grocery shopping, that's all the better for, for, uh, for you and us. Um, elections is another big area that people uh, know us. Uh, we're an award-winning program. We have, have won six national awards for various things, from our support of National Guard to our efficiency in delivering election services to our outreach to the uh, disability community. So we, we, we do that. Um, how our model differs from Sarah's as far as um, voting method, we are a modified or a hybrid mail ballot um, state. So we have voter service and polling centers in addition to the ballots that we mailed out. Um, so we, we mail out ballots and people are able to vote in the comfort of their home. Uh, we make it very easy for citizens to vote and hard to cheat. Um, the method of voting in Colorado that uh, the other 63 counties um, administer has been judged by the Wall Street Journal and U.S. News Today uh, as being one of the, the, the safest and most secure places um, to vote in the country. So that's a distinction that we're, we're very, um, very proud of. Uh, so if you can go, Richard, if you want to go to the next slide. You know, our recording area, we're we're responsible for recording legal documents, deeds of trust. Um, we're very busy here right now with uh, um, refis, with uh, the very, very low interest rates. A lot of people are buying homes, uh, selling homes, 
and also refinancing their homes and taking advantage of the low interest rates. We, while some pl places have, from a business standpoint, been a little slow because of the COVID crisis, our recording um, department is actually doing record numbers. Uh, we also do, like I said earlier, issue marriage license and civil, civil unions for uh, citizens in El Paso County. Uh, our clerk to the board, sort of similar to what Sarah does for her city council board. Uh, we record the minutes. We help them set up the, the agenda. Uh, we also do liquor and medical marijuana licenses for those areas that are not under uh, municipal control. Um, we also, for the county commissioners and the assessor's office, we uh, handle tax appeals in what's called the Board of Equalization. Go to the next slide. You know, we have a communications department. It's something that we have worked uh, very hard the last couple of years uh, to get m more and more information to our citizens, whether it's elections or how they can uh, interface with off our office with uh, motor vehicle transactions, recording. It's something that uh, Christy Ridlin, our PIO, does a superb job. She's able to get a lot of earned media, free media, for our offices to help keep our citizens uh, informed. She does a great job of that, works very hard on the social media platforms. And then our operations area, you know, we have many duties that we, we perform, and it takes a, a small department that kind of keeps them all humming. They, they maintain the, the facilities, they do the purchasing, the ordering of supplies, uh, the logistical supports that goes with with an election from uh, laying out the ballot to printing the ballots, mailing them out, uh, opening up our drop boxes, which we have 35 around the county. Uh, a number of them we have partnered with the city of Colorado Springs. Sarah and the Parks Department has been very good about getting us additional locations. We added over 10 um, 24 7 drop boxes over the last year. Uh, most citizens are within a few minutes of a drop box. So once again, we make it easy to vote, but, but hard to cheat. And then we have our, our finance department. We collect receipts uh, from motor vehicle, from payments for elections, from recording. Uh, we record that income and then we disperse it to the various entities, the other municipalities for their sales taxes that come from vehicles. Uh, so we, we collect about $180 million a year collect that and then send that on to the various uh, geopolitical entities for, for their con uh, conduct from uh, fire districts, the special districts, and municipalities. Okay, next. You know, uh, the statutes that we operate there for the people that want to kind of get into the weeds, um, our office functions and fees are controlled under Title 30 of the Colorado Revised Statute. Our authority for what we do in motor vehicles is under Title 42. You know, our, our requirement is only to do motor vehicle services, but we have an agreement with the State Department of Revenue that does the driver's licenses, the permits for driving licenses, issues the test, CDLs, reinstatement. Um, they have one office in town, and back about uh, 16 years ago when they went through some budget crunches, uh, we had some space in our offices. The county commissioner said, hey, can we, can we help our citizens? Can we pitch in? Can you take on some driver's license services? So we, we do the renewals of driver's licenses for citizens here, and then uh, we're able to, when you come in from out of state, we're able to transfer that Connecticut or Ohio or Kentucky uh, driver's license to uh, Colorado. Uh, our recording department is... Uh, uh, the rules and uh, regulations are under Title 30, but also Title 38 and 14, and then our work under the Board of County Commissioners are under Title 30, and for the Board of Equalization, under Title 39. Okay, next slide. You know, how do we differ? You know, Sarah kind of said uh, some of the things uh, that we already touched that we're different. We're under a different portion of the Colorado Revised Statute. We handle multiple elections in a year. This year has been very busy for us. We've had three elections. We just got done a few months ago, the presidential primary. First time Colorado has done that in 30 years. So that was new to us. Um, June 30th, later this month, is the party political primaries in which people will be voting. Ballots went out on Monday. 
Um, I already heard from people that um, people were getting them in their mailbox yesterday. Um, be patient. The Postal Service sometimes takes a few days to get that all rolled out. If you haven't received your ballot by the end of the week, Friday, please call our office at 575-VOTE. That's 575-8683. Um, we also do the November coordinated elections in odd number of years and the November general elections that we're going to have this year that will coincide with uh, an election of our new you know, of a president and then also U.S. Senate and the various House uh, representatives, state senates, and then uh, district attorney and county commissioners. So we have, like I said earlier, a hybrid model. We have both uh, ways that people can come in person and vote um, a period of several weeks before the election, or they can vote in the safety and security now with COVID uh, in their, their own homes too. So we can go to the next slide. So some key dates that we're working on right now, a couple weeks ago, um, we sent out our military and overseas ballots. Those are citizens that are either traveling abroad, working abroad, or our military men and women, which we have a lot in this community that find themselves in the four corners of the world. They, under federal law, they get an extra bit of time because of how far away they are. They get up to 45 days to vote. So back on May 15th, we sent 5,400 ballots to those citizens, those members of the military um, to vote. Um, they also get a few extra days on the back end. They get eight additional days after the election uh, to secure their vote. Uh, a few days ago on May 20th, we did our logic and accuracy testing. That is a public test where we have members of the Democratic and Republican Party and other interested folks that can come in and see our equipment in operation, the equipment that's going to do our tabulation. They can watch and make sure that it's tabulating correctly um, so that they have confidence on election night that everything was copacetic. Uh, earlier this month, June 1st, so it was the last day for people to uh, affiliate for the political parties. Um, June 8th, which was earlier this week, like I said, we mailed out 408,000 ballots. Uh, we have a number of secure locations that people can drop off their ballots. They can go to our website, EPC Votes, that stands for El Paso County Votes, Com, and we have a lot of information for citizens, the listing of where those uh, drop boxes are, the listing of where our vote centers are. Um, if people want to come in and vote now um, or update their registration or, or, or uh, haven't registered in Colorado, we allow people to register up to and including Election Day. They can come in into our main office, which is on Garden of the Gods Road at the Citizen Service Center. And then uh, later this month, on June 22nd, we open up additional vote, uh, voter service and polling centers, and you can vote in person if you like that experience. You can surrender your ballot that you got in your mail. We have handicap accessibility, voting options for our citizens at those locations. If you spoil your ballot, mismarked it, uh, you can get a replacement ballot. You can do voter registration or just drop off your ballot. Uh, June 22nd is also the last day that um, People who want to put a stamp and drop and mail their ballot back, that's the last day that we recommend people to do that because all our mail nowadays goes all the way up to Denver, gets processed at the general mail facility, and comes back. Um, and then uh, election day is June 30th. All ballots must be received by 7 p.m. It isn't enough to be postmarked. It has to be actually physically in our hands at 7 p.m. on, PM on election day. Next slide. Uh, you know, with respect to COVID, it's been challenging for everybody, and I'm sure Sarah uh, can, can speak to the challenges um, in their offices. Uh, back in March, when this started to raise its head and become a concern, um, we, still, we still was here. We were still working to do services, but we had to do it in a different way to keep our staff safe and to keep our citizens. So for the first uh, two months, we were doing a lot of back office operations, uh, stuff that we needed to catch up. We were still receiving titles from people who had purchased a car from dealerships. We worked our back office functions. Um, we expanded our phone bank. Typically, we have four or five people on our phones that are answering questions, helping with um, services there. We expanded to 20 stations. 
Um, right now, we're, we're handling between 600 and 1,000 calls that are related to motor vehicles. Um, so we became kind of a motor vehicle-centric operations. Um, a month ago, May 1st, we started in-person services, but we wanted to uh, make sure our staff was safe and that our citizens were safe. So we issued, um, we do services by appointment. You can go to our website and you can set an appointment. That allows us to get that six feet or better physical distancing uh, between each other. Um, we've been, you know, we've really been encouraging our online services as much as possible, our, uh, our kiosk services. You know, our staff has been instructed on how to keep themselves safe. They're being given uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, all our staff wears masks. Um, we can't require the public to wear masks because we're a governmental agency and we're under ADA rules uh, because we have to be accessible, but we do ask um, people gently to wear masks uh, to keep them safe and keep our employees safe. We've extended, we've, we've added plexiglass panels in all our office uh, to keep ourselves safe, hand sanitizers, encouraging, you know, the best of, best of hygiene. Our, our offices are included in, you know, are clean, a deep cleaning on a regular, uh, regular basis. So we're doing a lot to keep our employees and citizens surf at, uh, uh, safe at this time. Okay, next slide. And then I'm open to any questions that citizens may have. I have to keep reminding myself to unmute. Um, thank you both. Uh, I think we have one question from uh, Lisa Bachman and uh, I think uh, I think I need to unmute Lisa. So, <laughs> I, is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> well, you did it yourself. So there you go. <laughs> I did it myself. I unmuted myself. So first, I want to thank Sarah and Chuck, both of you, for all this everything you do for our citizens. You, both of your departments, I've interacted more with Sarah than you, Chuck, although I think I send you money for something. I'm yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but you both do an amazing job for our citizens, so thank you. Um, Lisa's having some, having some difficulty with her sound. You want to okay. try that again, Lisa? Um, did, so you didn't hear what I, what I, my compliments? <laughs> we, we did hear the compliments. We didn't hear all the compliments, I think. Okay, well, you're doing wonderful. Keep it up. <laughs> Thank you. So my question is for Sarah on the status of the census. Thank you. I totally forgot about the census work that I'm doing. How dare I? Um, we, uh, one of the things that we are working closely on is the Pikes Peak Area Complete Count Committee, which is a partnership with the city of Colorado Springs, El Paso County and Teller County. And we have been working uh, basically for the last year on getting the word out to everyone. So in case there's anyone on this call or soon whoever wants to watch it, please, please complete your 2020 census document. We are, the city um, of Colorado Springs is at 68.1% participation at this point and the county is right there with us around 68% also. So it's going well. We had 70, a little about 70.4% participation in this city uh, 10 years ago. And what we're getting and wanting now is please, please, please respond to the census. If you did not get the request to respond letter in the mail, you can go online to 2020census.gov and there is a link for you to self-report um, yourself and all of those individuals that live in your home. And that includes everyone from that newborn baby on to uh, you know, your parents and great grandparents and those kind of things. And you don't um, have to be a citizen to participate. Uh, we really want everyone to participate. It is a decennial census, the US Constitution requires it. And everyone is counted 
So please stand up and be counted. There's so much that relies on census data. Not only Chuck and I can attest to redistricting, relies on pure population numbers, not if you're registered to vote or not, but it's population based. And just think of all of our COVID response that you know Chuck talked about and we're doing similar things in the city. A lot of that emergency, the FEMA money, when you have floods or hailstorms, et cetera, a lot of that, the base element of that is your census population numbers um, that come out and everything from road money to whether your school offers all day kindergarten or free lunch programs um, or honestly where when it where a business chooses to locate um, whether they come to our city or not or go into the county that is all in some part based on census numbers so please please stand up be counted I want you to vote because that's important in elections, but I also would love for everyone to please stand up and you matter, you count, respond to the census. So thank you, Lisa, for that great question. You bet. So I have, an, I have another question, if that's okay. I, I would love to know from both of you and maybe Chuck, start with you. Uh, you've outlined what you've been doing for COVID. Uh, but what what other challenges is the county and your department specifically facing in the future? I mean, things are are all different now. We don't know where they're heading, but sure. what are you thinking the biggest challenges ahead are? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Lisa. You know, I think growth is, is a concern. We have five motor vehicle offices, and with the growth, it makes our offices um, even busier. So about planning for additional motor vehicle locations, expanding the locations that we have so that we can service more, more citizens. Uh, the other challenge is that before, before this COVID crisis, uh, you know, we had challenges in, in hiring, you know, finding good qualified people because the economy was, was red hot. And so those have been some challenges and I think that's gonna be that way for, for years to come is, is finding good qualified people that are committed to uh, providing excellent customer service uh, for our citizens. Uh, being, being there, being creative and making sure we meet the customers how they want to transact with us. Uh, we have been working very aggressively. Um, more and more people want to use, use this thing, your smartphone to interface with government. They're looking for virtual government opportunities. So we have an app on our phone uh, for citizens that they can uh, access services. Um, our marriages, marriage licenses, you know, COVID has kind of pushed us into an area where we used to have to do marriage licenses. At least one of the two parties need to appear personally in front of us. Um, but COVID has uh, allowed the governor, Governor Polis, to do an executive order that allows us to do that now remotely. Um, so we're doing marriages for right now um, electronically. Um, it's working well. Um, I wouldn't be surprised in, in uh, next spring if we don't see that maybe become uh, something uh, permanent. Um, with respect to elections, um, you know, I think the things, the challenges we have coming up in elections is with social media, there's always a lot of people that put out information that is not correct about elections. Um, there's a, a lot of stuff that is not true. And trying to inform voters and keep them informed about how we vote in Colorado, how we make it very easy, while at the same time people think, well, you make it so easy, there'll be voter fraud. But we have a number of mechanisms in place that keeps voter fraud out. You know, there is no system that is 100% perfect. Um, if you have no fraud, and you have a system that has no fraud, it, it makes it hard for our citizens to vote. So I think Colorado, and I know the city of Colorado Springs, we have struck that, I think, that correct balance between making it easy, um, but hard to cheat. We have signature verification. You know, all throughout our, our, all our steps, we have bipartisan teams. Uh, we welcome people in to observe our processes and, and, and watch and, and the like. So um, the big challenge, I think, in elections is, is um, you know, making sure there's good information that we are driving good information out to our citizens and driving out that bad information. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of talk in 
the national debate about mail ballots because we do it very well and other states are looking to want to do that. And you know, I go from time to time to, to conferences, election conferences of election professionals, and when they go around the room, when we introduce ourselves, and I say I'm from Colorado, I usually get a bunch of people at breaks or lunches that come over and want to talk to me and hear how we have done what we've done because they hear many great things. And when I tell them the things that we've done, um, you know, it's really been a 12-year process for Colorado to get where, they, where we are. A lot of different statutes were enacted. Uh, best practices are shared by, by county clerks, um, work with vendors, um, qualifying print vendors, and the like. You know, it's taken us a dozen years to get there, um, and, I, and I, I encourage other states to do that. But, you know, be patient. It takes a long time to do it right. So uh, I, I'm bold by the fact that others want to do what the Colorado model is, but it's going to take some time to, to make sure we do it right. Awesome. Thank you. Sarah, how Thank about you? you? Any uh, challenges from the city perspective? Um, our challenges are really similar to what Chuck has said. Our, the city office buildings are now open to the public to come into our offices. We started that on June 1st. Uh, prior to that, we were doing drop-off boxes and those kind of things. The real struggle that we're seeing out there is in our business community. Obviously, doing business licensing, in particular liquor licensing, you know, and talking with those restaurant owners because they have been closed for so long, and now they're trying to reopen, and we're working a lot with liquor laws. As you can imagine, those are not really simple laws. They're local and state uh, governed, and so we've been waiving fees and review Doing all of the city processes from land use to my office on the licensing side to streamline those processes to make it as simple as possible for those businesses to, to open or in the case of restaurants to be able to expand a lot of you may have seen some expansion of their patios and their outdoor dining soon to see maybe closing some streets and pieces of Tejon to get those businesses open and to get all of you guys out there. I don't know about you, but the first time I went to a restaurant this last weekend after all of the shutdowns, it was so nice. It was so delightful to sit in a restaurant. So those are some of the things we've really been focusing on is trying to get businesses back up and running, trying to get information out there, trying to get stuff on our website, trying to maybe hurry up some of our online uh, permitting processes that we um, hadn't uh, been able to go live yet, but getting that sped up. One of the biggest things that the state of Colorado and all the municipalities are so reliant on sales tax uh, out here. And so that's why we want to get these businesses open so that not only people can get that nice mental health break of going into a restaurant or a store and seeing people, but it also helps provide funding so that we can continue to get out there and uh, fix those roads and conduct these elections and those things. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both again for your participation. Great. Thank the you. Great work. Thank you all. I, I am having some difficulty with my audio, but I believe Stephanie has a question. Um, yeah, hi, thanks, Dave. Um, and thank you um, both also for your presentation and all the information. It's really valuable. Um, my question has to do with the elections, and it's uh, for both of you. Um, are there traditionally um, parts of town or parts of the county or certain populations where we've traditionally had um, a low voter turnout in those areas? And what are the efforts that, you know, kind of in increasing um, the voter turnout in those areas? And also, um, perhaps, um, what are some, some things that um, groups like, um, you know, I, myself, I work for Kono, I'm the program officer. What are, what are some things that um, groups like Kono and other community groups can do to um, enhance a voter turnout? Or check all that you you want to go first, Sarah? Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> No, basically, I will say for the city of Colorado Springs elections, uh, historically, lower turnout is typically in the southeast, which is District 4 for us right now. Um, that historically over the years has just been a little bit lower turnout, although there is, you know, precincts within districts across our city that tend to have lower turnout. Um, 
but that's generally the area. So what we have done is work with groups like Kono, uh, League Women Voters, Citizens Project, uh, Rias Coalition is who we've worked with a lot on the census and are talking about doing some working uh, for our elections next year. But we partner a lot with those groups, uh, giving them messaging, key dates. We do a lot of media. Uh, for example, you know, the Southeast Express has been really a great partner and will continue to be a great partner with us uh, through media, but it's really word of mouth. Uh, you know, your, your neighbor, your father, your son, your whatever, uh, telling you why the reason it is to vote. And that's going to be really important for us next year because we're doing district elections, so they're closer to the people type elections. And one of the biggest things is partnering with Chuck, and he can talk more about this, is getting those 24-7 ballot boxes and the VSBCs out into those all across the, the city uh, for our perspective and doing that. And so I'll turn it over to Chuck, but that's some of the stuff that we've done. And, and I'm very open to ideas and anyone that wants to partner with us for next year and for redistricting processes in the census, let me know. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, and I think this is where our, you know, where the difference in the models between the city and county, where, where maybe we have an extra ability to help uh, drive voter participation in an area. So when we make it very easy and we're always constantly between the Secretary of State's office and our office uh, doing PSAs and working through social media and our, our print media and our, our our other multimedia platforms encourage people to vote. We have an online site for uh, govotecolorado.gov that people can go to to vote. Um, you know, our VSBC models is where we put voter service and polling centers in, in those neighborhoods. We'll, we will have 32 of those locations around the county. We work closely with our GIS department and our voter debt registration database to get those VSBCs in those neighborhoods. We, we would look for places that are large, we look for places that are along bus lines that have our ADA accessible and stuff. So we have worked very hard to make sure that we have voter service uh, and, and polling centers throughout the county, throughout the city so that we make it easy to vote. You know, Colorado enjoys the third highest level of voter participation, turnout, voter registration. We we lead the country in, in many categories in voter participation, and um, we're usually the one, two, or three in the country. So Colorado citizens can be very proud, citizens in El Paso County and Colorado Springs can be very proud of the mechanisms that we put in to help people to vote. Um, so we, we work very hard, you know, uh, partnering with the city on, on those drop boxes to get them in locations that um, traditionally we haven't been able to, it's been a, been a great partnership too. Thanks Chuck. I have a question for both of you um, regarding um, sales tax and property tax and kind of the decrease in tax revenue. Um, how has that affected uh, both of you? I'll let you go Sarah because I think uh, the, the city is probably more based on a sales tax model than, than the county. Sure, it is, it is definitely the, the shutdown of all the businesses, the hotels, the conference traffic, the you know, canceling of conferences and those things is definitely affecting the city with sales tax. Um, we just released uh, the April numbers and they were about 20% down from where they would normally be. Um, so it is affecting us. It is certainly causing the mayor and council to take a look at all of our, the city budgets. We've all had budget cuts at this point and I suspect we will have more as we go through. But it is definitely something that council and the mayor are watching closely as all of us are. And that's really sort of um, helping us get the push to streamline those business services that I talked about to help do what we can to get those businesses back open because that's their livelihood. And it also obviously affects our sales tax, but we are affected by that and we are working closely uh, and watching everything really closely because we want to be able to um, have those summer youth programs that are just now beginning to open up and to offer these, these things and to fix those roads that we all um, have to drive on. So we're cautiously watching it and making adjustments um, as we go.
Yeah, from the county standpoint, um, the revenue streams for the county is, is a bit different than the city. Um, we depend about 60% of our revenue stream from property taxes and the other 40% from sales taxes. So we're a little bit more insulated from that. People had already paid their property taxes earlier in the year before uh, COVID hit. Uh, we still in motor vehicle, when a person purchases a vehicle, we collect sales tax. Um, in the month of March, where we had a half, you know, half a month that was affected by COVID, we saw a 13% reduction in tax revenues, which then um, the county keeps a small portion of that. Most of it goes to the state, and then another portion goes to various municipalities between Colorado Spring, Monument, Fountain, and, and the like. Uh, um, so we saw that we in the month of April, we saw closer to a 26% uh, reduction. However, the month of May, we only saw a 15%. So we're starting to it's starting to come out of that. So um, I was very I was very emboldened by the fact that we were um, only 15% down last month in where we were a year ago um, in sales tax. So I, I think there's hope. I think there's a glimmer of hope that is on the horizon. And you know I'm buoyed by the fact that unemployment seems to be turning around. So um, hopefully we're going to get back and, and get back to a strong, robust economy like we had going into this year. Great. Thank you both. Um, and I have kind of a pie in the sky question. Um, if you have, if you want to make uh, one improvement or get one new technology or uh, complete uh, one uh, priority that, that you really want, what would that be for both of you? Hmm. Sorry, I stumped you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fr from our standpoint in elections, we just upgraded our election equipment a couple years ago. It's, uh, it's a, a fantastic system. Um, it's quick. It's easy to use. It's, uh, you know, it's been tested by national election agencies to be extremely accurate. Their test is not to have more than one misread of an oval out of a half million, and our equipment went um, over two million cycles without any mistakes. Uh, they finally just stopped because uh, at two million uh, cycles, if you didn't get a mistake, there's probably not likelihood you're going to find one out of three million. So we have very, you know, a very robust election system, very good system. So we've made that investment and we're, we're good for the next 10 years. Um, the one thing that I do need in elections is more physical space because in the November election, we'll probably have 325,000 to 350,000 ballots that are returned. Um, I just need more, I need more elbow room. I need more physical space to, to, uh, to spread out and, and do that processing. You know, on the motor vehicle side, you know, just continuing to encourage citizens to utilize online services, our smart app, um, our kiosks, so that they can, that they can, you know, they can interface with us, their off, our office, and and easily, so that they can do the things that Colorado citizen people, why they live here, they want to explore the great outdoors and enjoy life. Um, they don't want to enjoy life by being inside a, a motor vehicle office sitting around, waiting around. So, uh, you know, the use of technology to, to better serve our citizens. And that, that's the same on my side is we're in the process of working with the vendor now to get a lot of online services for my office through business licensing uh, in particular. And so that would be my pie in the sky is for the city as a whole. I know the departments have a great desire to do a lot more online abilities than we are, but that would be my wish is that we can get more um, online activities because people do not operate anymore in an eight to five atmosphere. They're a 24 seven uh, business. And so that's what our goal is to get more online abilities so that you don't have to come physically to the office, um, but you're, we certainly like to see people. So come on down and visit us. But just to get that out there for everybody would be my pie in the sky is more online technology. So go out there and um, Give us some sales tax revenue so we can do that. 
Pen money, that's the, that's the advice. <laughs> um, I have a um, question from Dave. Um, Sarah, uh, could you kind of describe the redistricting process a bit more? Um, when, when will the advisory committee meet and when its final report is due? Um, sure, the, the process begins now. And so what that is, is probably, and obviously with the COVID-19 restrictions that we're all under, we'll do a lot of this through virtual meetings uh, like Zoom um, or Teams, but we'll have those meetings. The committee is going to be meeting. Actually, uh, we're working on getting them all together this week. Uh, to get a date set, but stay tuned for a lot of information. We'll have a lot of public information gathering meetings from uh, each individual district. We'll invite individuals to participate and comment on District 1 and its boundaries and it needs to grow and which direction would you like to see it grow. We'll have some sample, um, sample scenarios out there for everyone to see. Um, at that point, we'll do a lot of social media output, trying to get people to have some comments or to give us some things that they would like to see, maybe parts of the city that if one district has to absorb it, what would they absorb as far as precincts? So that'll happen uh, at later this month and into July and possibly into the front of August. Uh, the process advisory committee, which their main goal is to get out there and get that public comment. Um, from individuals and that will happen again in June and July, the same time we're getting these meetings. They'll issue uh, their prelim report will probably come out in August of this year, just explaining the input. There'll be multiple ways for people to input using a lot of social media too. And then the, the IS city clerk will take all that into effect and work on drawing uh, a, a district, a preliminary map and that map, I'll try to get that released in late September um, or early October. And that will be put out again for public comment through virtual means. And also hopefully by then we might be able to have some in-person uh, meetings with social distancing. And basically the, the city charter has me setting the boundaries in November. So probably by the middle of November, we'll have the final districts set. And those districts are what are the territories that candidates will then take a look at uh, or potential candidates will take a look at and they'll determine whether they want, that'll be one factor of many, right? Uh, whether they decide to run or not because candidate filing for those six district seats begins uh, the first uh, work day in January. So it's a, it's a, quick process. So that's why I say stay tuned. We don't have the actual calendar set up, but uh, look for those public input meetings specifically to be in, like I said, late June, July, and then uh, also commenting on the preliminary map issued by the city clerk, which will be in November, kind of late October, November on that one, because the goal again is to get those districts set as quick as I can, given the uh, legal parameters within the city charter about when I can finish that process up. Great, thanks. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, so I want to thank you both for, for talking with us today. Um, you both play, play a pretty critical role um, in the county and the city and how we govern. So uh, thank you so much. And um, for any, everybody else, uh, Kona would love to hear from you. If you ever have any questions or just want to talk to us, you can email us at information at uh, cskono.org. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank you, Sarah and Chuck. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you both. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you, guys. You too. Okay.